Welcome to the opening meeting of the seventh session of the Pro Fide Forum. When we started it seven years ago, we hardly hoped that it would run as long as seven years. But in fact, it goes from strength to strength. And the words of wisdom from our speakers reaches far beyond the walls of this hall. There are various means of cassette tapes and videotapes, and we feel that it's a very worthwhile undertaking that we have um, pursued here. Certainly our speaker tonight also reaches far and wide through his books as a renowned author and he is also in demand as a speaker practically all over the world. And everybody in the church who is concerned about Orthodox Catholicism knows the name Michael Davis. And we are both delighted and honored to have him here with us this evening. So I'd like to begin by quoting the opening words of the Gospel of St. John, which concludes the traditional Mass of the Roman Rite, in Principio Erat Verbum. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The opening words of the Gospel of St. John remind us that when we consider any aspect of the liturgy of the Catholic Church, we must begin by focusing our minds upon God. The liturgy of the Catholic Church has meaning and significance only in so far as it is directed towards God. St. Augustine of Hippo, who tried for many years to live without God, eventually discovered that God has made us for himself and that our hearts can know no peace until they rest in him. God is our creator. We are his creatures. Without him, we would not exist. Without him, we would not have that hope of everlasting happiness in heaven, which alone enables us to endure the suffering and sorrow of our exile in this valley of tears. We owe God everything. He owes us nothing. Those who are created have a duty to love and serve their creator. It is only when men live their lives within the correct perspective of the creator-creature relationship that harmony and order prevail. When they repudiate this relationship, Disharmony and disorder take over, the disharmony and disorder of sin. The first note of disharmony in the whole of creation was struck when the archangel Lucifer, the most magnificent of all God's creatures, was overcome with pride and boasted, non serviam, I will not serve. Who is like God, answered St. Michael, quis ut deus. Who is like God? These are words which should be at the forefront of the mind of every Catholic. The answer, of course, is that no one is like God. He is infinite, and we are finite. Between infinite and finite, there can be no comparison. We must, therefore, as the Catechism teaches us, devote our lives to knowing, loving, and serving God in this world so that we can be happy with him forever in the next. This is our duty as his creatures. If you love me, warned our Lord, keep my commandments. The commandments of God enjoin a solemn obligation of sanctifying the Sabbath by rendering our Heavenly Father worthy and reverent public worship. The only adequate expression of our absolute submission to Almighty God is the offering of sacrifice. Historians of comparative religion have found sacrifice to be a common feature of all the principal religions throughout the history of civilization. It is an action which clearly corresponds to some basic human instinct. St. Thomas Aquinas taught that offering sacrifice is a duty incumbent upon all men according to the natural law. The obligation would have existed even if Adam had not fallen. Such a sacrifice would have represented adoration of our Creator, thanksgiving for his loving goodness to us, and a plea for a continuation of this protection in the days to come. But the tragedy of the fall added a fourth reason for the offering of sacrifice, the need to obtain forgiveness for our sins. 
The essence of sacrifice lies in the offering of a victim to God on behalf of the people by their publicly appointed representatives. The death of the victim is not an end in itself. It is not the object of sacrifice. The victim dies so that its life may return to God in whom that life originated. The victim represents those for whom it is offered. Its death represents their total self-surrender to God. An almost bewildering series of rituals incorporating every aspect of sacrifice can be found in the Old Testament. Paramount among them was the Holocaust. This was the perfect sacrifice because the entire victim was consumed by fire, thereby signifying the absolute submission of man to God. Peace offerings conveyed praise and thanksgiving, while sin offerings were intended to absolve men from their guilt. The most significant moment of Jewish sacrifice was the pouring of the blood of the victim upon the altar. The altar of sacrifice in the Jewish temple represented God, just as the Christian altar represents our Lord Jesus Christ himself. The blood of the victim was said to contain its life, and when poured upon the altar, it had been returned to God, in whom that life had originated. The most solemn of all Jewish sacrifices took place upon the Day of Atonement, commonly known as Yom Kippur. On this one day in the year, the high priest passed through the veil of the temple into the Holy of Holies, where God himself dwelt. There, face to face with God, he would offer the blood of a sacrificial victim in atonement for his own sins and the sins of the people. The Christian religion has only one sacrifice, the sacrifice that was once offered when our Lord Jesus Christ, acting both as priest and victim, shed his blood for us upon the cross. Every type and every purpose of Old Testament sacrifice was fulfilled to perfection on Calvary. Holocaust, peace offering, sin offering were all merely types, shadows, figures of that one perfect sacrifice on the first Good Friday when God the Son made man reconciled all things unto himself, making peace through the blood of his cross, both as to the things that are on earth and the things that are in heaven. Insofar as the Old Testament sacrifices had been offered sincerely with an humble and contrite heart, they had pleased God and brought blessings upon those who had offered them. But such sacrifices could never atone for the sin of Adam and the sins of all his descendants. In a perfect sacrifice, priest and victim must be identical, but this had been impossible before the coming of our Lord. In Hebrews 9 we read that the high priest entered the Holy of Holies with blood not his own. The blood of animals could never atone for human sin. In Hebrews 10 it states that it is impossible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. In the same two chapters of Hebrews we are taught that our Lord appeared as the high priest of the good things to come and passing through the veil of his flesh entered into the true Holy of Holies, heaven itself, to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. He bore not the blood of goats or of calves, but his own blood, thus obtaining for us an eternal redemption. The path to heaven, which had been barred by the sin of Adam, had been opened, and all the redeemed can follow their high priest into the Holy of Holies. This was made clear when the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom at the moment when our Redeemer died after offering his precious blood to atone for our sins. On Holy Thursday at the Last Supper, our Saviour offered the sacrifice of Calvary in anticipation. He also consecrated his apostles as bishops and commanded them to offer this self-same sacrifice as his commemoration in order that, as the Council of Trent teaches us, he might leave to his own beloved spouse, the Church, a visible sacrifice such as the nature of man requires. Whenever this visible sacrifice is celebrated, the sacrifice of the cross is made present. When we assist at Mass, we are present at Calvary. In his work, the Mass of the Roman Rite, 
Father Joseph Youngman wrote, When Christ on the cross cried out his consummatum est, few were the men who noticed it, fewer still the men who perceived that this phrase announced a turning point for mankind, that this death opened into everlasting life, gates through which, from that moment on, all the peoples of the earth would pass. Now, to meet the expectant longing of mankind, this great event is arrested and, through Christ's institution, held fast for these coming generations, so that they might be conscious witnesses of that event, even in the last centuries and among the remotest nations, and might look up to it in holy rapture. Our word liturgy is derived from a Greek root, meaning a public duty or service to the state undertaken by a citizen. In the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament, this word is used for the public service in the temple and is thus invested with a religious sense as the function of the priests in the ritual of Jewish worship. Our Lord is described as the liturgos of holy things in Hebrews 8. The liturgy is his holy work for his people. The liturgy is thus not primarily something which we do, but something which our Lord does. It is an action of Christ, an actio Christi in Latin, but an action with which his mystical body, the Church, is able to unite itself. In his encyclical, Mediator Dei, Pope Pius XII defined the liturgy as the whole public worship of the mystical body of Jesus Christ, head and members. I stated earlier that the liturgy of the Catholic Church has meaning and significance only in so far as it is directed towards God. It is equally true to state that it has meaning and significance only in so far as it is considered an exercise of the priestly office of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord's priestly office on earth did not come to an end when he ascended into heaven. He perpetuates it in his mystical body, the Church, which, in its innermost reality, is an extension of the Incarnation throughout the nations and the centuries. Our Lord is present among us today in his Church, teaching, ruling, and sanctifying us. Priests who have received their orders in direct succession from the Apostles offer the Mass in Christ's name and in his person in persona Christi. Our Lord himself is the true high priest of every Mass. The priest at the altar acts only as his instrument. In the traditional Mass of the Roman Rite, now commonly known as the Tridentine Mass, this sublime truth was symbolized fittingly by the manner in which the priest subordinated himself to the awe-inspiring holiness and majesty of the Rite which he was celebrating, the Rite which Father Faber described as the most beautiful thing this side of heaven. A prayer in the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom evokes the profound truth that it is really thou who dost offer and art offered, thou who dost receive the offering and art given back to us, Christ our God. The sacrifice of the Mass is truly the sacrifice of Calvary made present among us, a sacrifice at which we should dare to be present only in a spirit of the utmost reverence and most abject humility, conscious of our unworthiness in the presence of the all-holy God. Quam terribilis est haec ora, cries out the deacon in the Syrian liturgy. How awesome is this hour! Awesome it is indeed when our Saviour and our God is present among us as priest and victim. Now I'd like to say a few words about the development of the Roman Rite. The most holy sacrifice of the Mass has been and is offered in many different rites, but whatever the rite, the sacrifice itself is identical. There is only one Mass. A rite of Mass consists of the words and ceremonies surrounding the essential elements instituted by our Lord. The different rites of Mass evolved in a gradual and natural manner over many centuries. The only liturgical book used up to the 4th century was the Bible. But during that century, the practice of writing down the liturgy became established, 
and the parent rites of the various liturgies in use today soon became discernible. We should be concerned today almost entirely with the Mass of the Roman Rite in its traditional form, as it was known to us until a new rite of Mass was promulgated in 1969. At no time in the history of the Mass of the Roman Rite had there ever been, prior to 1969, any question of a Pope setting up a commission to compose new prayers and new ceremonies. As the centuries passed, prayers and ceremonies evolved in an almost imperceptible manner, and in every case codification, that is the incorporation of these prayers and ceremonies into the liturgical books, followed upon their development. Thus, particular prayers and ceremonies were found in the Missal because they were being used in the Mass and not vice versa. This is a crucially important distinction. One of Britain's greatest historians, Professor Owen Chadwick, remarked that liturgies are not made. They grow in the devotion of centuries. The practice of referring to the traditional Mass of the Roman Rite as the Tridentine Mass is unfortunate. It has led to the widespread impression that this Mass was composed following the Council of Trent. The word Tridentine means pertaining to this Council, the Concilium Tridentinum, which took place at various periods between the years 1545 and 1563. The Council of Trent did indeed appoint a commission to examine the Roman Missal and to revise and restore it according to the custom and right of the Holy Fathers. The new Missal was eventually promulgated by Pope St. Pius V in 15th century. Sorry. The new Missal was eventually promulgated by Pope St. Pius V in 1570 with the bull quo primum. Respect for tradition characterized the work of the commission which prepared it. There was at no time the least suggestion of composing a new order of mass, a novus ordo misse. The very idea of a new order of mass is inconceivable to anyone imbued with a true sense of being a Catholic, a true sensus catholicus. The commission codified the existing missal, purged it of a few items which it considered superfluous or unnecessary, a few sequences, for example, but as regards the ordinary, canon, proper of the time and much else, it is a replica of the Roman Missal of 1474, which dates back in all essentials to the epoch of St. Gregory the Great at the end of the 6th century. In his classic study of the Roman Missal, which was published in 1917 and is entitled The Mass, Father Adrian Fortescue, England's greatest liturgical historian, made a lengthy study of the reform of St. Pius V. His conclusion was that we may be very grateful that the commission was so scrupulous to keep or restore the old Roman tradition. He adds that up to the time he was writing, since the Council of Trent, the history of the Mass is hardly anything but the composition and approval of new Masses. The scheme and all the fundamental parts remain the same. No one has thought of touching the venerable liturgy of the Roman Mass, except by adding to it new propers. This observation could equally well be applied to the five decades which passed after Father Fortescue's book had been published. Some changes were made by Pope St. Pius X by Pope Pius XII and by Pope John XXIII, but where the Mass was concerned, these were mainly confined to the rubrics. Such a reform had been made necessary by the large number of new saints, whose propers had been added to the Missal since 1570. Pope Pius XII also made an extensive reform of the Holy Week ceremonies. The changes he made were all eminently sensible, of great pastoral value, and in complete harmony with tradition. We could then apply to the Mass, as we knew it at the conclusion of Vatican II, a judgment made by Father Fortescue in 1917. Our Mass goes back without essential change to the age when it first developed out of the oldest liturgy of all. It is still redolent of that liturgy of the days when Caesar ruled the world 
and thought that he could stamp out the faith of Christ. When our fathers met together before dawn and sung a hymn to Christ as God, the final result of our inquiry is that, in spite of unsolved problems, in spite of later changes, there is not in Christendom another right so venerable as ours. There is not in Christendom another right so venerable as ours. This then is the Tridentine Mass, the most venerable right in Christendom, the most beautiful thing this side of heaven, as Father Faber expressed it. It is the form of Mass which, the Bible apart, is the Church's greatest treasure. It is her pearl of great price, which should be more sacrosanct, more <coughs> inviolable than anything else she possessed. Writing of this Mass, John Henry Newman remarked, Nothing is so consoling, so piercing, so thrilling, so overcoming, as the Mass said as it is among us. I could attend Mass forever and not be tired. It is not a mere form of words. It is a great action, the greatest action that can be on earth. It is the evocation of the eternal. He becomes present on the altar in flesh and blood before whom the angels bow and the devils tremble. Consoling, piercing, thrilling. This is how Cardinal Newman described the Tridentine Mass. Yet there were those before and during the Second Vatican Council, and their number has increased immensely since, who claimed, contrary to Newman, that the Tridentine Mass was dull and uninspiring, that it had nothing to say to men of the 20th century, that it was an obstacle to their spiritual development. This surely is a judgment which reflects not upon the Tridentine Mass, but upon its critics. How has it come about that the attitude to worship of Cardinal Newman and that of virtually all the great Catholic thinkers up to the 1960s has been almost universally repudiated by the contemporary ecclesiastical bureaucracy? In order to understand this, we must have a clear understanding of what took place at the Second Vatican Council. But before doing so, it is necessary to make a brief examination of the Protestant Reformation. I shall use the terms reformers and reformation as this is now the accepted convention when describing the religious upheavals which destroyed the unity of Catholic Europe in the 16th century. A true reformer corrects what is wrong, corrupt, unsatisfactory. He strives to restore an institution to the condition which existed before the advent of the abuses which had corrupted it. St. Gregory the Great was a reformer. St. Leo IX was a reformer. But Martin Luther and Thomas Cranmer were revolutionaries. A revolutionary wishes not to reform, but to overthrow the existing order and replace it with a new one which he has devised. The Protestant heresiarchs of the 16th century overthrew the religion established by our Lord Jesus Christ and replaced it with a series of new religions concocted by themselves. They were not reformers, but revolutionaries. I've mentioned several times that never in the history of the Church until the Second Vatican Council had any Pope so much as considered the composition of new liturgical rites. The Protestant heresiarchs were the first to take this step. They needed to do so because of the clear manner in which the traditional rites of Mass expressed the doctrines of sacrifice and the real presence, doctrines which they rejected. Evidently, the missals which the Protestant heresiarchs repudiated were not identical to the missal of St. Pius V, which was not published until 1570. There was considerable variety in the missals used throughout the Roman Rite. The Popes, as patriarchs of the Latin or Western Church, had never attempted to impose uniformity in liturgical matters upon the churches of the Latin Rite. It may surprise you to learn that the Bull Quo Primum was the first written legislation promulgated by a Pope regulating liturgical matters. Up to this point, the law of custom had been sufficient. 
Mass was celebrated different, differently, not simply from country to country, but in some cases from diocese to diocese. However, the various missals differed only in minor matters. In every important respect, they were identical to the missal used by the Pope in Rome. That is why, in most cases, they are not termed rites of mass, but simply uses. The most widely used missal in England prior to the Reformation was that of Salisbury in Wiltshire, known as the Serum Use. It's just interesting to note that uh, when Westminster Cathedral was built, uh, serious consideration was given to reviving the Serum Missal for use in the cathedral, which if that had been done, we wouldn't have been affected by the changes of Vatican II. But eventually they opted to use the uh, Roman Rite. And the Serum Rite, of course, has never actually been uh, forbidden and I would imagine any priest in this country who wanted to use it could use it quite legitimately. As I have just mentioned, it was not possible for any of the new Protestant sects to use the existing missals because they express Catholic Eucharistic teaching so clearly. There is a well-known axiom, lex orandi, lex credendi, which roughly translated means that the manner in which we pray reflects what we believe. The Protestant reformers were united in believing that the Eucharist was no more than a bare commemoration in which we remembered our Lord and all that he had done for us and ate bread and drank wine in his memory. There was no sacrifice other than a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving which takes place at any Protestant prayer meeting. And the bread and wine remain bread and wine throughout the entire service. Nothing of their natural substance was changed, insisted the reformers, and to offer any form of honour or worship to the consecrated elements represented idolatry. Father Adrian Fortescue remarks that when the reformers composed their own communion service, services in place of the existing missals, they broke away utterly from all historic liturgical evolution. It was as a response to this liturgically expressed heresy that the Council of Trent decided that Mass should be celebrated uniformly throughout the Roman Rite. It would be an exaggeration in most cases to claim that the Protestants composed entirely new liturgical rites. They tended to adapt the existing Catholic rites but remove from them everything which was not compatible with the particular heresies they favoured. In a study published in 1898, the Catholic bishops of England and Wales condemned in very forceful terms the action of the founders of the Anglican heresy in mutilating so drastically the venerable rites which had been used in their country from time immemorial. That in earlier times local churches were permitted to add new prayers and ceremonies is acknowledged, wrote the Catholic bishops, but that they were permitted to subtract prayers and ceremonies in previous use and even to remodel the existing rites in the most drastic manner is a proposition for which we know of no historical foundation and which appears to us absolutely incredible. The Catholic bishops added a special word of censure for Thomas Cranmer, the apostate Archbishop of Canterbury, who had been the principal author of the new Anglican liturgy. In taking this unprecedented course, they stated, he acted with the most inconceivable rashness. What, I wonder, would these same bishops have thought if they had been told that in 1969 the Vatican would authorize a new rite of mass for which the ancient and venerable rite in previous use had been remodeled in the most drastic manner and from which almost all the prayers removed by Thomas Cranmer in the 16th century had also been removed. They would, I am sure, have greeted such a suggestion with laughter as it would have appeared so utterly preposterous. Let us then examine what took place during the Second Vatican Council in order to discover how what would have appeared preposterous in 19, I'm sorry, 
in order to discover how what would have appeared preposterous in 1898 became a reality in 1969. In 1959, Pope John XXIII announced his intention of convoking a general council. No one knows why the elderly pontiff made this momentous decision. He claimed that it was due to an inspiration from the Holy Ghost. This was simply his personal opinion, and no Catholic is bound to believe that this was the case. Previous general councils had been convoked to combat heresies or other evils of the time. The great Jesuit historian of the Council of Trent, Carlo Pietro Pallavicino, warned that to convoke a general council except when absolutely demanded by necessity is to tempt God. Any historian wishing to prove that convoking the Second Vatican Council was an absolute necessity would have a difficult task in proving his thesis. Be that as it may, the council was convoked. Pope John was most optimistic about the fruits he expected from it. He spoke of opening windows to let a little fresh air into the church, and he categorized those who did not share his optimism as prophets of doom. His unhappy successor, Pope Paul VI, accepted that more than fresh air had entered the church through the windows opened by Pope John. He lamented the fact that the smoke of Satan had entered the church to suffocate the fruits of the council. The council had opened in October 1962, and by 1968, Pope Paul had warned that the church was engaged in a process of self-destruction. That this is indeed the case was observed by the outstanding French theologian liturgist, Father Louis Bouillet, who was an expert advisor at the council. Unless we are blind, he remarked, we must even state bluntly that what we see looks less like the hope for regeneration of Catholicism than its accelerated decomposition. There are, of course, many in the church today who prefer not to face up to reality. They do this by closing their eyes. Considerable animosity was manifested by European bishops towards Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, when he admitted frankly that it is an incontrovertible fact that this period has definitely been unfavorable for the Catholic Church. Pope John had explained that the object of his council would be to preserve the sacred deposit of Catholic doctrine intact, but to present it in a way that would have the maximum appeal to contemporary man. This may have been his objective, but it was not the objective of all those who were present in Rome to participate in the 21st General Council of the Catholic Church. Some who were present did not wish to present the old faith in a new way. They were more concerned with replacing the old faith with a new one. These men were found not so much among the Council Fathers, the bishops, but among the expert advisors they had brought with them to Rome. These men were the Periti. Periti is the plural of the Latin word peritus, an expert advisor. Douglas Woodruff, editor of the tablet at the time of the council, described Vatican II as the Council of the Periti. Bishop Lucy of Cork and Ross in Ireland claimed that the Periti were more powerful than most bishops, even though they had no vote. The reason, he explained, was because they were influential in drafting the council documents, and they often exercised considerable influence with a key cardinal at the head of a national conference of bishops. This state of affairs has spread throughout the church since Vatican II. Policy statements issued in the name of national hierarchies are often the work of a handful of liberal so-called experts and to all too often the bishops do more, no more than rubber stamp what the experts have drafted for them. The majority of council fathers who arrived in Rome in 1962 were not very clear as to why they were there or what they were supposed to be doing. The one exception to this rule was what Father Wilkin has described as the Rhine group in his classic account of Vatican II, The Rhine Flows Into the Tiber. 
The Rhine group consisted of bishops and their periti from countries bordering upon the river Rhine. Catholicism in these countries tended to be liberal or progressive, as opposed to the conservative Catholicism of the Latin and English-speaking countries. The thinking of Catholics in these countries had been considerably influenced by their experience of the Nazi tyranny before and during World War II. Germany had suffered the longest experience of this evil system. Countries such as France, Holland and Belgium had endured the horrors of Nazi occupation. The sharp differences which had existed between Protestant and Catholic before the war appeared almost irrelevant when set beside the bonds which united them in suffering during the Nazi persecution. After the war, there was not surprisingly considerable impetus to achieve the unity of Christians. There was a tendency to minimize what separated Catholics from Protestants and to accentuate what united them. The late Cardinal Heenan testified to the extent to which the English-speaking bishops were unaware of the type of council the Rhine group forces were planning. The Americans, he testified, were even less prepared than the British. He remarked on the extent to which ecumenism had been made a religion within the Rhine group, particularly among the Dutch. Some Dutch Catholics had made almost a religion of ecumenism, said Cardinal Heenan. Impatient of any dogmatic difference, they were ready to barter any doctrine in the cause of external unity. Impatient of any dogmatic difference, they were ready to barter any doctrine in the cause of external unity. This was not only the attitude among influential Dutch Catholics on the eve of the Council, but among some German Catholics as well, not to mention their counterparts in France and Belgium. It has become the predominant attitude within the Catholic establishment in almost every country today. Charity, caritas, has become the supreme norm by which our attitude to those outside the faith must be regulated, and it has become the supreme norm at the expense of truth, veritas. Truth is the great casualty of the ecumenical movement. Any doctrine can be bartered in the cause of external unity, and not simply doctrine, but any tradition, including the most sacred liturgical traditions. But those imbued with an authentic Catholic instinct, a census catholicus, will know that there can be no conflict between charity and truth, between caritas and veritas. Charity towards those outside the church demands that we do not conceal the truth, but present it to them so that they can embrace it joyfully. And where Protestantism is concerned, Newman has said all that needs to be said. Now, Protestant and Catholic are not both right and both wrong. There is but one truth, not two truths, and that one truth we know is in the Catholic religion. Can any true Catholic dare to claim that the great Cardinal was wrong in stating this? And if it was true when he stated it in 1851, it is equally true in 1987, because the truth is the truth and it can never change. The truth of the Lord remaineth forever. Veritas Domini Manet in Aeternum. How did it come about that the results of Vatican II were so different from those intended by Pope John XXIII? Cardinal Heenan has remarked that God was merciful in allowing the aged pontiff to die before he saw the extent to which his counsel was used as an excuse for undermining so much of the Catholic doctrine which he upheld so staunchly. In his personal beliefs and attitudes, Pope John was conservative. There is no reason to suppose that he would knowingly have countenanced any compromise on basic Catholic truths to further ecumenism. The same can be said of almost all the bishops present at the Council. The liberal Pariti were very well aware of this. They knew that few of the Council Fathers would vote for anything evidently in conflict with tradition, and so they adopted the tactic of inserting ambiguous passages into the documents, 
passages which could be interpreted in a manner that was far from traditional once the Council had concluded. The existence of ambiguity in certain Council documents is a fact upon which there is agreement among commentators of every viewpoint, ranging from Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre to Hans Kung and the Protestant observers. It is thus naive to claim that no responsibility for the post-conciliar disintegration can be laid at the door of the Council, or that this disintegration has taken place in spite of the Council. Of course it can and must be argued that there is only one authentic interpretation of apparently ambiguous conciliar teaching, and that is an interpretation in the light of tradition. But the essence of ambiguity is that more than one interpretation is possible, and these ambiguous passages, together with the widespread impression that changes were inevitably to be expected, gave the enemies of tradition the weapon they needed for their assault upon orthodoxy after the closure of the Council. Previous Councils had formulated their teaching in terms so clear that only one interpretation, an orthodox interpretation, was possible. The failure of Vatican II to present its teaching in terms of univocal orthodoxy represented a radical and lamentable breach with conciliar practice. Professor Oscar Kuhlman, a leading Protestant observer at the Council, designated its documents as compromise texts and added, with no little satisfaction, all the texts are formulated in such a matter, I'm sorry, all the texts are formulated in such a manner that no door is closed and that they will not present any future obstacle to discussions among Catholics or dialogue with non-Catholics, as was the case with the dogmatic definitions of previous councils. Obviously, if the liberal Pareti were to use the ambiguous passages they had inserted into the council documents in the manner they had intended, they needed to gain control of the commissions which would be set up to interpret and implement the council after the bishops had returned home. Cardinal Heenan was the, aware of the danger of this happening, and he warned against it. He warned the fathers of the manner in which the Pariti could produce texts capable of both an orthodox and modernistic interpretation. He told them that he feared the Pariti and dreaded the possibility of their obtaining the power to interpret the council to the world. God forbid that this should happen, he exclaimed. But happened, it did. On the 26th of June, 1966, the tablet reported the creation of five commissions to interpret and implement the Council's decree. Members of these commissions were, the report stated, chosen for the most part from the ranks of the Council Pariti. Everything had go gone according to plan. The wheel had turned full circle. The men who had drafted the documents now had the power to interpret them. Jesus wept over Jerusalem, lamented Cardinal Heenan, and John would have wept over Rome if he had foreseen what would be done in the name of his council. It is no wonder that Pope Paul wept. On the 4th of December 1963, the Council Fathers voted on Sacrosanctum Concilium, the conciliar constitution on the sacred liturgy, and passed it by an overwhelming majority. Even the most conservative fathers did not so much as suspect that it might constitute a blueprint for revolution. Professor Louis Celeron, one of the most respected conservative Catholics in France, was so impressed with the Constitution that he remarked in his book The New Mass that far from appearing to be the means of initiating a revolution, it appeared to be the crowning achievement of the work of liturgical renewal which had been in progress for a hundred years. Possible doubts about certain passages would have been allayed by what seemed to be built-in safeguards, which were certain to preserve the ethos of all approved liturgical rites from any change inconsistent with their own traditions. 
Article 4 of this Constitution alone appeared more, more than sufficient to ensure that there were no radical innovations. Article 4 states, In faithful obedience to tradition, this most sacred council declares that Holy Mother Church holds all lawfully acknowledged rights to be of equal authority and dignity, and she wishes to preserve and foster them in every way. Thus, while accepting the possibility of some minor innovations, the Council Fathers were reassured that the ethos of the Roman Rite would be preserved, and not simply preserved, but fostered. Has this command of the Council Fathers been observed faithfully? Let Father Joseph Gellinau answer. Father Gellinau was present at the Council as a liturgical expert. He performed the same function after the Council for the Concilium, the commission set up to implement the Constitution. He has been active ever since explaining and implementing the changes in his own country of France. Father Gellinau is a liberal. He makes no secret of it. He wanted radical change, and he is delighted that he has been given what he wanted. In his book, Demain la Liturgie, Tomorrow the Liturgy, he reveals what has happened to the Roman Rite in terms of absolute and commendable frankness. There is certainly no ambiguity here. Let those who, like myself, have known and sung a Latin Gregorian High Mass remember it if they can. Let them compare it with the Mass we have now. Not only the words, the melodies, and some of the gestures are different. To tell the truth, it is a different liturgy of the Mass. This needs to be said without ambiguity. The Roman Rite, as we knew it, no longer exists. It has been destroyed. This, then, is the truth, the plain and varnished truth. The Roman Rite, which so many of us once knew and loved, the Rite of Mass, which formed the spirituality of countless great saints and countless millions of humble Catholics throughout the nations and the centuries, this form of Mass, the most venerable Rite in Christendom, the most beautiful thing this side of heaven has been destroyed. The Council Fathers ordered that it should be preserved and fostered in every way. Well, how you preserve and foster anything by destroying it is something I am quite unable to understand. Perhaps an erudite priest like Father Gellinau could explain it to his own satisfaction, but he certainly could not explain it to mine, and I hope not to yours. It has become the established practice for liturgical experts and in all too many cases for bishops, the shepherds of their flocks, to rebuke priests or laymen who so much as question the value of any liturgical change imposed since the council by telling them that they are disobedient to the council itself. They do this on the presumption, which is alas almost always only too well founded, that most priests and laymen will know little or nothing of what the Council actually taught concerning the liturgy. It is the duty of every Catholic who loves tradition to familiarize himself with the liturgy constitution of Vatican II so that he is able to distinguish between what the Council is alleged to have commanded and what it actually did command. Once this distinction has been made, it is indeed evident that there has been disobedience to the Council disobedience on a massive and global scale, but the disobedience lies first and foremost with those who took it upon themselves to destroy the Roman rite, your birthright and my birthright, and the birthright of our children. Article 23 of the Constitution appears to be as reassuring as Article 4. There must be no innovations unless the good of the Church genuinely and certainly requires them, and care must be taken that any new forms adopted should in some way grow organically from forces already existing. Well, has this command been observed? Those of you who still possess a missal containing the former rite might like to spend an hour or two examining it to see. Those of you who still possess a missal containing the former rite, might like to spend an hour or two examining just the ordinary of the Mass, the part which remains the same each day. Examine each change and ask yourself, 
this question, was it genuinely and certainly required by the good of the church? Are you better Catholics because you no longer genuflect to the incarnatus during the creed? Are your children more devout than you were at their age because those sublime words from the first chapter of the Gospel of St. John are no longer recited at the conclusion of each Mass? Are your priests holier men because they no longer recite the psalm Eudicame at the beginning of their Mass, the psalm which reminded them that they were about to offer a solemn sacrifice upon the altar of God in Troibo at Altari Dei? Furthermore, if you examine the changes carefully, you will notice an alarming coincidence, one which I mentioned earlier. Almost every prayer and ceremony which has been removed corresponds with a prayer or ceremony removed by the Protestant reformers in the 16th century. Article 21 commands that, in this restoration, both texts and rites should be drawn up so that they express more clearly the holy things which they signify. Holy Mass is primarily a solemn sacrifice offered to Almighty God by a priest acting in the person of Christ. Could even the most enthusiastic defender of the new liturgy claim that this has been expressed more clearly in the new Mass than the old? If it is not, then those who compiled it were disobedient to the Council. What there is no doubt about at all is that spokesmen for a number of Protestant sects have hailed the reform right as a welcome step in the direction of the Reformation. While the Tridentine Mass remained the central act of worship of the Roman Rite, there could have been no substantial progress in Catholic-Protestant ecumenical dialogue. The Tridentine Mass was too evident a testimony to the sacrificial basis of Catholic worship, which is anathema to Protestants. So, it had to go. And for what? In all the ecumenical negotiations which have followed the Council, the concessions have come from only one side, the Catholic side. Our liturgical heritage has been destroyed, Catholic truth has been compromised, the faithful has been scandalized, and all there is to show in return is what our bishops describe as a changed atmosphere. The atmosphere has been changed indeed to one of religious indifferentism, in which other religions are placated by a spirit of false ecumenism. This brings me to the question of the vernacular. Time and time again we are told that the Council ordered a change from Latin to the vernacular. It did nothing of the sort. Article 36 states, Particular law remaining in force, the use of the Latin language is to be preserved in the Latin rites. A concession was made that some vernacular could be introduced in certain parts of the Mass where it was thought pastorally useful. The fathers of the Council were led to believe that this would be principally in the readings. There is no doubt that they wished Latin to remain the norm. Had they wished for a general change to the vernacular, they would have stated that Mass would be celebrated in the vernacular in future, but that where it was thought pastorally desirable, some Latin could be retained. Not so. Latin remained the norm, and a limited use of the vernacular might be introduced as a concession. The Council did not command that ever, anywhere, at any time, a single word of the Mass must be in the vernacular. Let those who would dispute this point point, point out any text in the liturgy constitution giving such a command. Furthermore, Article 54 commanded that steps should be taken so that the faithful may also be able to say or sing together in Latin those parts of the Mass which pertain to them. This command of a general council has been disobeyed flagrantly throughout the West. And what about music? Did the Kermak Council command anything here? It most certainly did. Article 116 reads, The Church acknowledges Gregorian chant as proper to the Roman liturgy, and therefore, other things being equal, it should be given pride of place in liturgical services. How many parishes do you know of in which this explicit command of a general council 
is not being defied. I have quoted two extracts from the liturgy constitution of the Second Vatican Council, which seem to safeguard the Roman Rite from any radical change. I mentioned the opinion of Professor Louis Celeron that the constitution appeared to be the crowning work of this liturgical renewal, which the papally approved liturgical movement had been working for throughout the present century. Professor Louis Bouillet, who I mentioned earlier, the French liturgical scholar, who is one of the more conservative Parisians at the Council, was so impressed with the Constitution that he wrote a book, which some of you may have seen, called The Liturgy Revived, which was published in 1964. In this book, he prophesied the flowering of a great liturgical renewal inspired by the Constitution. By 1968, he was totally disillusioned. He expressed his disillusionment in a new book entitled The Decomposition of Catholicism. In this book, he protested that what was being imposed in the name of the Constitution was not simply a betrayal of what the Council Fathers had intended, but of the liturgical movement itself. And this was a full year before the new rite of Mass had even been promulgated. Father Bouillet went to the extent of stating, we must speak plainly. There is practically no liturgy worthy of the name in the church today. How could it come about that a liturgy constitution containing all the safeguards which I have mentioned could have been used to justify a liturgical revolution on a scale sufficient to evoke so radical a denunciation from a scholar noted for his balance and moderation? Remember, too, Father Gellinow's boast, the Roman rite has been destroyed. I have already given you the answer. Ambiguities were inserted into the text by Pariti, who planned to interpret the Constitution in a manner which the fathers who voted for it did not even suspect. Is this simply a gratuitous allegation made by a mere layman who is not even present at the Council? Far from it. Cardinal Heen was not only present at the Council, but was one of the most active of the Fathers. In the, his book, A Crown of Thorns, he provides us with the following testimony. The bishops were under the impression that the liturgy had been fully discussed. In retrospect, it is clear that they were given the opportunity of discussing only general principles Subsequent changes were more radical than those intended by Pope John and the bishops who passed the decree on the liturgy. His sermon at the end of the first session shows that Pope John did not suspect what was being planned by the liturgical experts. What could be more straightforward than this? Cardinal Heenan is telling us in terms of commendable frankness that the Pariti were intending to use the Constitution in a manner which the Pope and the bishops did not even suspect. The ambiguous passages which the Pariti inserted in the Constitution were time bombs, programmed to explode after the Fathers had returned to their own countries. The time available to me makes it possible to cite only a few examples. I have already mentioned the clause in Article 54 requiring that the people must be able to sing or say together in Latin those parts of the Mass which pertain to them. But Article 54 also contains a time bomb which blew sky high the legislation of the Council, mandating Latin as the norm for the Roman Rite. It consists of no more than a concession. It states that a suitable place may be allocated to the vernacular in masses which are celebrated with the people, especially the readings and the common prayer, and also, as local conditions may warrant, in those parts which pertain to the people. Liberal commentators on the Council have accepted that most fathers imagined that they were merely authorizing the possibility of the vernacular for the catechetical or dialogue portion at the beginning of the Mass, while the principal parts would remain in Latin. The Fathers were assured that the canon of the Mass and other prayers said by the priest, specifically in his role as celebrant, 
the offertory prayers, for example, were excluded from the terms of Article 54. Cardinal Montini of Milan, who was later to become Pope Paul VI, stated specifically during a council debate on the Constitution that it was unthinkable that the canon could ever be in any other language than Latin. When it is a matter of the language used in public worship, he warned, think seriously before you decide that those parts of the liturgy which belong to the priest should be in any other language than that handed down by our forebears. For only thus will the unity of the mystical body at prayer and the accuracy of the sacred formulas be maintained. Prophetic words indeed. Had the Council Fathers read the text with a more critical eye, they would have noted that it did not explicitly prohibit any part of the Mass from being celebrated in the vernacular. The impression they were given was that any part of the Mass not specifically included was excluded. But the interpretation of the Pariti after the Council was that any part not specifically excluded was included. And as I've mentioned, no part of the Mass was specifically excluded. We should not judge the Council Fathers too harshly for their lack of vigilance. These were the days in which Catholics as a whole still trusted each other. On the day in November 1963 when voting for the liturgy constitution took place, the typical Council Father was blissfully unaware of what the experts were planning. The extent of this unawareness has been attested to by the late Archbishop Robert Dwyer of Portland, Oregon in the USA. Archbishop Dwyer was undoubtedly the most cultured of all the American bishops present at the Council. He attests that he saw nothing in either the text or the spirit of the document which would suggest the least deviation from the historic past of the liturgy, its sacred traditions, its venerable usages. Who dreamed on that day that within a few years, far less than a decade, the Latin past of the Church would be all but expunged? that it would be reduced to a memory fading in the middle distance. The thought would have horrified us, but it seemed so far beyond the realm of possibility as to be ridiculous. So we laughed it off. And when the vote came round, like wise Sir Joseph Porter, KCB, we always voted at our party's call. We never thought of thinking for ourselves at all. That way you can save yourself a whole world of trouble. Archbishop Dwyer went on to lament the fact that the Latin Church has cut itself off from its cultural roots and its whole magnificent musical heritage. He recollected a warning given during the Council by the great Cardinal Michael Brown of Ireland. Cave armas, patres, cave armas. Let us take heed, fathers, let us beware. We thought it amusing then. We might take it a little more seriously now, heard Archbishop Dwyer. We might indeed. We might also have heeded a warning from the greatest of all liturgists, Dom Presper Guéranger. In his work, Liturgical Institutions, which was published in 1840, he warned of an anti-liturgical heresy which has characterized all the enemies of the Church. When we study this heresy, he warned, we shall see diabolical wisdom at work, striking skillful blows and leading infallibly to vast consequences. The first characteristic of the anti-liturgical heresy is hatred of tradition as found in the formulas used in divine worship. Every sectarian who wishes to introduce a new doctrine finds himself unfailingly face to face with the liturgy, which is tradition at its strongest and best and he cannot rest until he has silenced this voice, until he has torn up these pages which we call the faith of past centuries. As a matter of fact, how could Lutheranism, Calvinism, Anglicanism establish themselves and maintain their influence over the masses? How indeed? Please take a moment to decide for yourselves what the answer is. How did the Protestant sectarians establish themselves and maintain their hold over the masses? Here is Don Guéranger's answer. Please listen to it carefully 
and face up to the grim reality of its implications. All they had to do, states Don Guéranger, was to substitute new books and new formulas, and their work was done. All they had to do was substitute new books and new formulas, and their work was done. There was nothing that still bothered the new teachers, he wrote. They could just go on preaching as they wished. The faith of the people was henceforth without defense. This bears thinking about, does it not? Please ponder these words in conjunction with the judgment of the Catholic bishops of England and Wales concerning the liturgical rites composed by the apostate Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer. To remodel the existing rites in the most drastic manner is a proposition for which we know of no historical foundation and which appears to us absolutely incredible. Article 14 of the Liturgy Constitution contains a truly devastating time bomb. It states that the active participation of the people is to be considered before all else in the restoration of the liturgy, or at least that is what the translations of the Constitution claim the Latin word used in the Constitution means. But the Latin word for active is activus. It does not appear in the Constitution anywhere. The word which is employed is actuosus. It's not easy to provide an English translation of this word. It implies activity, but with the accessory idea of zeal, a sincere, intense, interior participation in the Mass. It is this interior participation to which prime consideration must be given. During the Mass, we should be raising our hearts and minds to God, uniting ourselves with the priest at the altar in offering the divine victim and offering ourselves in union with him. This is the ideal which Pope Pius XII placed before us in his encyclical Mediator Day in 1947. There is then a clear change of emphasis between Mediator Day and Article 14 of the Liturgy Constitution, even though this would not have been evident to the Council Fathers who voted for it, this change of emphasis is one which permeates and characterizes the entire liturgical reform. It is a change of emphasis which provides every justification for designating this reform as a, res as a revolution. It is a change of emphasis in the liturgy from God to man, an action which negates the entire meaning and purpose of the liturgy. The very first point which we considered this evening was that the liturgy has meaning and significance only insofar as it is directed towards God. We also saw that the liturgy is our Lord's work for his people, not something which we do, but something which he does, with which we can associate ourselves. This is precisely what Mediator Day teaches. The word actuosus has invariably been translated as active, and is interpreted in the usual meaning of physical activity. Thus, rather than considering whether every aspect and every moment of the liturgy is truly right and fitting as a stage and a solemn sacrifice offered to Almighty God, every aspect and every moment of the liturgy is now considered from the point of view of its effectiveness in promoting the active participation of the faithful which the council commanded must be considered before all else. Cardinal Ratzinger has deplored the manner in which the word actuosus is generally interpreted. In his book, The Ratzinger Report, he states that the way this term has been employed following the council has exhibited a fatal narrowing of perspective. The impression arose that there was only active participation when there was discernible external activity speaking, singing, preaching, reading, shaking hands. This book was published in 1983. I'm sorry, it was published in 1985. In 1986, he expressed himself in far stronger terms in an article which appeared in the June 1986 issue of the Homiletic and Pastoral Review. In this article, he deplored the emergence of a new concept of the people of God in which God means only the people themselves, 
and in the liturgy the people celebrate only themselves. This, the cardinal points out, means that they celebrate absolutely nothing. The religion of God made man has been replaced by the religion of man made God. Until the Second Vatican Council, there was not the least doubt as to the fact that the Church throughout the Roman Rite was truly Roman. The catechisms used within that Rite throughout the world were based four square on the Roman Catechism. The Rite of Mass celebrated within that Rite throughout the world was identical in every word and every gesture to the Mass used in Rome. And to the Mass used in Rome, not simply in this century, not simply since the promulgation of the Roman Missal in 1570, but in most respects since the epoch of St. Gregory the Great in the 6th century, and in many respects for centuries before that. I've already cited the quotation from Father Adrian Fortescue, which reminds us that this rite of Mass goes back without essential change to the age when it first developed, out of the oldest liturgy of all, of that liturgy of the days when Caesar ruled the world and thought he could stamp out the faith of Christ. There are those exercising effective control in the church today who not only wish to stamp out that venerable liturgy, the liturgy which Father Fortescue reminded us is the most venerable in Christendom, but who think that they have actually done so let me assure you that they have not. In 1980, in his ap apostolic letter, Dominique Cheney, Pope John Paul II made what must be one of the most extraordinary statements ever to have come from a successor of St. Peter. It was an apology to each and every member of the faithful for the abuses inflicted upon them in the name of the liturgical reform. I would, the Pope said, like to ask forgiveness for everything which, for whatever reason, impatience or negligence, and also through the at times partial, one-sided and erroneous application of the directives of the Second Vatican Council, may have caused scandal and disturbance concerning the interpretation of the doctrine and the veneration due to this great sacrament. In the same apostolic letter, the Holy Father expressed his concern for those Catholics who had been brought up with the old liturgy in Latin and who felt deprived. The Holy Father wished to make this liturgy available for such Catholics once more, and despite considerable opposition from within the Vatican and from national hierarchies, in 1984 he authorized every bishop in the world to permit the celebration of the Tridentine Mass within their diocese. The indul giving this permission appears to be somewhat restrictive on a first examination, but a more careful study makes it clear that there is no limit to the number of masses which any bishop can permit. Some are already permitting a daily Tridentine Mass in certain parishes, and the number of Tridentine Masses celebrated throughout the world following the indul increases constantly. I might add that it is the opinion of eminent canon lawyers that the Tridentine Mass has never been legally prohibited with the full force of canon law, and that the promulgation of an indult was not necessary in order for priests of the Roman Rite to be able to celebrate it freely. I am convinced that these canon lawyers have an unassailable case, but I will not take up time explaining why. What is absolutely certain is that, that the Pope wishes Catholics who love the traditional liturgy which must surely be the expression par excellence of the Roman spirit, to be given access to it. Cardinal Mayer, Prefect of the Congregation for Divine Worship, has stated that the Holy Father wishes this indult to be utilized in a generous manner. Bishops who fail to do so, so are therefore obstructing the will of the Supreme Pontiff. This brings me to the question of the correct attitude which Catholics concerned for their faith should adopt towards the post-conciliar revolution. Some conservative Catholics feel that we should do no more than seek to bring an end to the manifest abuses which prompted John Paul II to offer his historic apology. They may believe that our wisest option is to seek to have the mass of the 1969 Missal said strictly in accordance with that Missal. This 
It's a position which I can understand and respect, but it is one with which I disagree totally. If the arguments I have put forward are sound, and I believe that they are, the liturgical reform which has followed the Council is something totally alien to the ethos of the Catholic faith. The composition and imposition of new liturgical rites upon the faithful is contrary to the entire Catholic tradition. The only precedent for such an action must be sought for within heretical sects. One must add here that, incredible as it may appear, six Protestant heretics were asked to advise the Concilium, which composed the new rite of Mass, and they were involved very actively in the process. Archbishop Annibali Bunini, chief architect of the liturgical reform, whose role I have not mentioned this evening, uh, as time, the time to do so is not available, denied that the Protestant observers were actively involved. I contacted one of them directly, and he assured me that the Archbishop's claim did not accord with the truth. Archbishop Unini was described by Professor Dietrich von Hildebrand as the evil spirit of the liturgical reform. This great theologian would not make such an accusation lightly, and he claimed that if a devil had been entrusted with the ruin of the liturgy, he could not have done it better. Professor Peter L. Berger, a Lutheran professor of sociology, commented wryly, if a thoroughly malevolent sociologist bent on injuring the Catholic community as much as possible had been an advisor to the church, he could hardly have done a better job. Perhaps the most alarming comment of all came from Archbishop Unini. The liturgical reform is a major conquest of the Catholic Church and has its ecumenical dimensions. A major conquest of the Catholic Church Nearly, but not quite. The Catholic Church can never be conquered. Our Lord has given us his solemn promise that the gates of hell will never prevail against his church. Let us recall once more the warning of Don Guéranger on the tactic of the enemies of Christ to destroy his church through liturgical change. All they had to do was to substitute new books and formulas, and their work was done. But despite all the efforts of Archbishop Unini to replace the Roman Rite throughout the world with his new books and formulas, he did not succeed. The Tridentine Mass refused to die and refuses to die. It was preserved in England through the intervention of Cardinal Heenan. It has been preserved in many countries through the apostolate of Archbishop Lefebvre and the Society of St. Pius X. It has been preserved because in country after country, Catholic priests and laymen refused to abandon the traditions they had received from their fathers. It has been preserved above all, I have no doubt, because it is indeed, as Father Faber told us, the most beautiful thing this side of heaven. It has been sanctified by the devotion of countless saints. It has been hallowed by the blood of countless martyrs. Cardinal Newman warned that although our liturgical forms were not received directly from God, Long use has made them divine to us, and to destroy them may result in the destruction of the faith they enshrine. We must be on our guard, the Cardinal warned, against those who hope, by inducing us to lay aside our forms, at length to make us lay aside our Christian hope altogether. What then must we do? We must make the preservation of the Tridentine Mass the most venerable rite in Christendom, the first priority in our efforts to halt the decomposition of Catholicism. We must, in fact, do more. We must not be content with its preservation. We must fight for its restoration to all the altars of our churches as the only recognized mass, the Roman rite. Pope John Paul II has given every bishop the authority to permit the celebration of the Tridentine Mass. It is our duty as laymen to press for its celebration with increasing frequency and accompanied as often as possible by the matchless beauty of Gregorian chant. The music which Vatican II commanded must become the norm for some masses. There are many Catholics who are totally orthodox who would disagree with me. They would claim that 
things have gone too far to be changed, that we must make the best of the Reformed liturgy, that we should concentrate our efforts on fighting for sound religious education, orthodox moral teaching, and the implementation of Catholic social te teaching. We must be realistic, such Catholics would claim. Well, there was no more realistic Catholic than Hamish Fraser, who's the anniversary of whose death was on the 17th of this month. Hamish fought as no other individual has fought for orthodox catechetics, religious education and social teaching, but as the years passed he became more and more convinced that there can be no restoration of true Catholic order which is not accompanied by a restoration of what he liked to term the immemorial mass. Let each of us do all that is in our power to ensure that the traditional mass of the Roman Rite is preserved and fostered in every way, in accordance with the command of Vatican II. Let us insist that we wish to worship God with the liturgy that is the greatest glory of the Roman Rite, the most venerable rite in Christendom. Let us recall the words of Father Faber. It came forth out of the grand mind of the church and lifted us out of earth and out of self and wrapped us round in a cloud of mystical sweetness and the sublimities of a more than angelic liturgy and purified us almost without ourselves and charmed us with celestial charming so that our very senses seemed to find vision, hearing, fragrance, taste and touch beyond what earth can give. The Tridentine Mass, the most beautiful thing this side of heaven, is not simply our inheritance. It is a sacred trust which we must preserve and hand on to generations to come so that they too can worship God with the beauty and holiness of the sacred rites that inspired, consoled and strengthened our fathers in the faith. I will conclude with a quotation from that great 4th century confessor, St. Athanasius, his almost solitary opposition to the heresy of Arianism put his life in danger. He had been excommunicated by a weak pope who had capitulated to the pressure of the Arians, but he travelled throughout the church from diocese to diocese, offering mass, preaching, and ordaining priests who would uphold the true faith. This was the message which he gave the laity upon whose support he depended and who, in their turn, depended upon him for the example and inspiration to remain true to the faith they had accepted in baptism. Let the exhortation of St. Athanasius be a rallying cry to us today. These are his words. The Church has not just recently been given order and statutes. They were faithfully and soundly bestowed upon it by the Fathers. Nor has the faith only just been established, but it has come to us from the Lord through his disciples. May what has been preserved in the churches from the beginning to the present day not be abandoned in our time. May what has been entrusted into our keeping not be embezzled by us. Brethren, as custodians of God's mysteries, let yourselves be roused into action on seeing all this despoiled by others. And that you'll be glad to know is that. <laughs>